movement said no. It is the cotton picker that's going to speak for this movement, not the teacher. Because they are the ones who know the most about what this system has done for their lives. And so I learned about a different kind of leadership that was, it's, if you, if you, uh, the traditional leadership that we learn is that you have usually very articulate, often charismatic and handsome, who does that sound like? <laughs> At the top, and leading everybody else. Well, this turned it upside down. The people at the top were Fannie Lou Hamer, who was uh, beaten within an inch of her life when she went to leave people down to register to vote, taken to Parchman Prison, and sentenced there for six months, and they scrubbed her skin with steel wool because it was too dark. And she was the leader, and if you persuade your history professors to show eyes on the prize, you will see her speaking at the Democratic National Convention because she became the voice of the movement, not Martin. Martin Luther King, actually, and I don't think he, I think he just regretted this and afterwards changed his mind, but he became part of the group to try and persuade this, well, I, I'm, you know, it's hard to try and give you the YCS perspective in the whole civil rights history, so excuse me if I'm jumping ahead and maybe causing confusion, but one of the purposes of the summer of the 64 was to try and integrate the all-white Mississippi Democratic delegation, because that was a presidential year, and um, because they wouldn't let African Americans into their party. There's a third party that was legally formed under the Mississippi State Constitution <coughs> that would send people to that convention to challenge that all-white delegation and to challenge the Democrats, not the Republicans, that they needed to integrate. They didn't have hardly any black people at all, except a couple from Harlem, a couple people from Harlem, and a couple people from Detroit. The De Democratic Party was an all-white party, practically, and an all-male party, practically, for all practical purposes in the 60s. And so here's these cotton pickers and sharecroppers, which are poor farmers, um, going to Washington, who have been elected, duly elected in these elections, to say, we challenge you. You cannot seat the all-white Mississippi delegation. And it was Martin Luther King and a few other interesting white liberals who said, look, we can't do this right now. We have to win this election. If we don't put Lyndon Johnson in, we're going to get this terrible right-wing Republican, which we really didn't have much of a chance. But um, <coughs> that's when we learned that, honestly, we didn't live in a democracy. We had very, and still have, very few women in proportion to the percentage of women in this, of our population in this country, who are in the Senate and who are in Congress. So that's a battle that still remains. Um, and so, basically, it was the role of the students to sort of turn the United States upside down and reveal, A, that the emperor has no clothes. We keep talking about democracy in the rest of the world. And you've got folks that are getting killed for voting in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Arkansas, Virginia, Kentucky. And what's so interesting to me is that students never felt like they had to ask anybody's permission or work under some adults, older adult, to do this. This was our job in society. We were driven to it because the adults abdicated their responsibility. Just as adults have abdicated their responsibilities in the last eight years of this administration. And really, there was very little outcry about it until finally, a lot of young people, and I, you probably noticed this even better than I did, really were, were the feet of this movement to put Obama in. If we hadn't had the young people do that turnout, I don't think this man would have won. So, the question is, are students reasserting this role again? Or are we going to go back to the status quo, where we kind of think it's all, we're fine. You know, there are poor people, but we just need to go and, you know. Uh, I don't want to demean soup kitchens, but if we're down there and we're helping with that, at least people are eating, and that is very true. At least people are eating. But what are the structural, what are the reasons, why is there structural poverty? What do I mean by that? 
in Appalachia. How many of you have been to Appalachia? Okay. That is a persistently poor area that has never climbed up out of poverty. What's the reason? Is that because people there just are incapable of creating an economy that's going to take them out of poverty? You know, and, and are you learning about this in school? What kind of economics are you learning in school that creates this kind of structural poverty? We know today that 38 to 40% of uh, families in this country are poor. Not by the poverty line poor, but there's another kind of bare bones living where they're, they're barely making it. So we know that that's a fact, but what kind of economics are we going to talk around that? So basically, this whole experience uh, formed me, in a sense, for the rest of my life, as you heard many of us around here. But mostly for me, it's centered on education. My biggest, biggest bitch, if you will, is the education system. You know, we talk about super learners and people who can't keep up. One of the things I do in my class is I make people go to the net and learn about their learning styles. Why do I do that? Because not everybody learns the way that the schools are set up to teach. <coughs> which is you know, the ability to read and comprehend and write to articulate that. There are the people who are artistic learners. There are people who are physical learners. There are people who basically are learners through relationships better than books. They could be gone to the best school in the world and be able to read impeccably, and they're not learning, because that's not the way they learn. And we basically have structure in an educational system that doesn't just create issues in your high school between super learners and not quite so super learners. It creates this huge gap between people who can get into college, and even that's kind of a trap because then you got to sort of still learn in the style in college, except in my class. Uh, and um, people who then just get left behind. I mean, there's something like in this country of all the high school graduates, only 37% are really prepared for college. What about the rest? Where are they going to work? How are they going to be able to live if college now has become a currency? And these are issues that you're facing. You're facing greater gaps in the sort of economy where there are people, you know, 18 times more affluent than any of us here, maybe 200 times. And then the gap between people in the middle and then people at the bottom. You're facing that in a different way than we do. Um, you're facing this sort of opportunity crisis about where will people be able to really um, work in the future? What will the economy look like? Is it really only going to be for the sort of uh, lucky few that could make it through and go on to get to graduate school? Or you know, what's going to happen? So the question really that was became a question for me, I think it's a question for you too, and that is, what is your, how is your education equipping you to really see the world as it really is? That's what we do when we observe, no? We look at it the way it really is. And, and you're having to do it on your own. You're, you're having to do it on, you know, in the summer or for a small, you know, short period here. Um, Gina went to Jamaica for 17 days. You know, which I really commend anybody who's done the Appalachian experience or is thinking about going on to South Africa. This is awesome. You know, but you're learning in spite of the system in some ways. Not to say that things haven't changed, because they have, but it's a little concerning to me that you don't realize that you stand on the footsteps, the, I'm sorry, you stand on the shoulders of people your age who changed this country 